It's my pleasure to welcome all of you, World Affairs Council members, community friends, and CNU faculty and students to Christopher Newport University this evening. We're in for a real treat. Our speaker, Ryan Crocker, is a former U.S. ambassador who is currently the dean and executive professor at the George Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. He also holds the Edward and Howard Cruz Endowed Chair at Texas A&M. He was the James Schlesinger Distinguished Visiting Professor at UVA from 2012 till 2014 and served as the first Kissinger Fellow at Yale University from 2012 until 2013. Prior to his retirement in 2009, Ambassador Crocker had a long and very distinguished career in the Foreign Service, spending 37 years serving our country. Among other notable achievements, he was assigned to the American Embassy in Beirut during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, and he survived the bombings of the Embassy and the Marine Barracks in 1983. He's had assignments in Iran, Qatar, and Egypt, and served as ambassador to five countries Lebanon from 1990 to 1993, Kuwait from 94 to 97, Syria from 98 to 2001, Pakistan from 2004 to 2007, and Iraq from 2007 to 2009. In 2011, he was called out of retirement by President Obama to serve as ambassador for a sixth time to Afghanistan. Ambassador Crocker was born in Spokane, Washington and grew up in an Air Force family, attending schools in Morocco, Canada and Turkey, as well as the U.S. He received his bachelor's degree in English in 1971 and has received honorary doctorates from numerous universities, including his alma mater, Whitman, Gonzaga, Seton Hall, and the American University of Afghanistan, among others. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the Association of American Ambassadors. He's also on the board of directors of Mercy Corps International. Ambassador Crocker has received numerous honors and awards, including the Veterans of Foreign Wars Dwight D. Eisenhower Award, the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Civilian Service, and the American Foreign Service Association Rivkin Award for Creative Dissent. In January 2002, he was sent to Afghanistan to reopen the American Embassy in Kabul. Subsequently, he received the Robert C. Fraser Memorial Award for Exceptional Courage and leadership in Afghanistan. In September 2004, President Bush conferred on him the personal rank of career ambassador, the highest in the Foreign Service. In May 2009, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced the establishment of the Ryan C. Crocker Award for Outstanding Achievement in Expeditionary Diplomacy. And in 2009, President George W. Bush awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest award for a civilian. He is, though, perhaps most proud of being named an honorary Marine in 2012, only the 75th civilian so honored since the founding of the Corps in 1775. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Crocker to Christopher Newport as he talks to us about the Middle East meltdown. Thank you, uh, Provost Dowdy, for that uh, generous introduction. I can be introduced in a number of ways. I, I kind of like that way. Uh, uh, another way to imagine it is pictorially. Uh, just conceive of every major foreign policy disaster to confront the United States since, say, 1979. And there's a picture for every one of them. I'd be in every one of those pictures, sort of first row, second from the left. It's, a, uh, it, it's an introduction that also reminds me that unlike uh, most of you in the audience, uh, sadly, uh, I have much more of a past than I do a future. Uh, it, it's great to be here at uh, Christopher Newport University. Uh, this, this is an outstanding school. I, particularly pleased uh, to be hosted in part by the, uh, the, the Reef Center um, and quite honored that uh, Dr. Reef himself is in the audience tonight. The, the Reef Center has as one of its goals raising awareness of, of the horror 
of genocide, of human rights violations, and of conflict. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those are precisely the issues we'll be talking about tonight as we look at uh, the meltdown in the Middle East uh, uh, here in 2015. I, I would just also um, comment on one other affiliation I have. I, I'm a, uh, a member of the board uh, of the uh, World Affairs Council of Greater Hampton Roads. Um, and I am very pleased that a number of my colleagues on the board uh, are, are here tonight. Uh, uh, Maria Zamet, uh, Al Ablowich, uh, Margaret Little, um, uh, Hal Berenson, uh, Jenny Jones, and of course, your own Tina Kempen Reuter. Uh, it, it's a great council, uh, and if you want to know what goes on in the world, uh, including my part of it, come to some council events. Uh, there are some terrific speakers, uh, and if you want to know what's going on, you can get on our mailing list, or um, uh, you can simply tune in to uh, uh, the region's own Kathy Lewis of WHRO. Thanks for being here, Kathy. Um, so, Middle East meltdown. I'm actually going to start somewhere slightly different. Uh, uh, this is a university, most of you here tonight are affiliated with it um, as students, as faculty, as supporters. I'd uh, just like to lay out a few qualities that I think are critically important uh, for Americans who want to go into international affairs or even just understand international affairs. Uh, what's been important to me in the course of my career uh, are some academic disciplines. Uh, for me, it's been history. Uh, uh, you aren't going to know what's going to happen tomorrow. You're not even going to understand what's going on today unless you know what happened yesterday. Americans have marvelous qualities. Uh, I think we are the greatest people on Earth. But we have some limitations, and one of them is we're ahistorical. That's not how we built this country. Uh, we're about today and tomorrow. Let's, let's get on and get her done. Um, well, that can gravely handicap us in complex uh, parts of the world, certainly in the Middle East. Uh, so history counts. Uh, uh, it is not a bunch of musty old facts uh, about long dead people. Uh, it's about how today got to be what it is. And it's only from that understanding can you begin to think of, about what tomorrow may look like. Uh, I'll touch on that in the Middle East context uh, as we go ahead. Uh, it, it's also enormously important to think of the world uh, from different corners and different axes. Um, uh, as the provost noted, I was an English literature major. Uh, that was and was and is my passion. Uh, um, I just wasn't good enough to sell a single story, but I sure read a lot of them. Uh, if, if you want to understand a complex region, knowing its history is key. But knowing a lot more is important. You know, know its imaginative literature, uh, its fiction, its poetry. Uh, know the stories that parents tell their kids before they go to bed at night. It will tell you a lot about the value and orientation of a society. Uh, uh, seek multiple avenues of access to a complex environment you don't understand. The medium for that access is, is foreign language. Uh, uh, my, my colleague Maria Zamet said at dinner tonight, uh, you know, there's a joke, a person who speaks two languages is bilingual, a person who speaks three languages is trilingual, so what do you call a person who speaks one language? An American. Uh, uh, you know, look, 
we're the greatest power in the world. If, um, if that foreigner over there doesn't understand you, just say it louder and slower until they get it. Uh, uh, but it puts us at a tremendous disadvantage in trying to even understand, let alone shape, global events if we can't communicate in the languages of the globe. I found it interesting that in the um, Iran nuclear negotiations, uh, they were held in English, of course. Um, the American team was pretty deficient in Farsi. Um, the Iranians had perfect English. They had perfect English because they went to our universities, uh, they lived in our country, uh, Mohammad Zarif, the uh, Iranian foreign minister, U.S. University graduate, many years as Iran's representative to the United Nations in New York. Do you think he understands us? Yeah, yeah, he kind of he kind of gets us. Do you think we kind of get him? We kind of don't. Uh, uh, let alone the guys behind him um, who didn't go to our universities and don't speak English. Uh, You know, another quality in, in international affairs and in life is another one that we're probably not supremely good at. Um, it's humility. Uh, you know, don't think that because we're Americans, we got it figured out. Uh, all those little people out there need to do is sit down and take notes while we tell them how it is and how it should be. Uh, uh, let me tell you, that makes for supremely bad policy uh, uh, and extremely poor consequences. A corollary of that is listen. Um, when I uh, first went out as an ambassador, I got some good advice, and that was one of the pieces of advice I got. When you meet the head of state or government, sit down and listen to him. You know, don't deliver your agenda. Uh, don't tell him what you're going to do in your first 90 days. Listen to him or her. Uh, it, it is absolutely essential. When I, when I went to Baghdad, it was the middle of the Civil War. Uh, uh, this troop surge was just starting. All hell was breaking loose everywhere. But I spent my first two meetings with the Prime Minister of Iraq not trying to get a darn thing done, just the two of us, uh, in the room, while I asked him how the world looked to him when he got up in the morning, uh, what his high school experiences had been, what it was like literally running for his life uh, as a very young man to stay a step ahead of Saddam's thugs. Uh, you know, I learned a lot about the Prime Minister of Iraq in those discussions that served me very well in trying to understand later on why he would do certain things. Uh, now, I couldn't have done it if I didn't have the language. Um, I, no need for an interpreter. Um, could be just the two of us. Nobody taking notes. Uh, so just keep all of these things in mind. Uh, importance of history, uh, the necessity of different paths to knowledge, uh, uh, the importance of language, uh, the importance of humility. Uh, okay, you've got all that because there is going to be a test uh, at the end of this. Uh, so let's, let's, let's move to the Middle East. Um, uh, and and this, this is my only slide. Uh, uh, tonight may be uh, hard to endure for a number of reasons, but it will not be death by PowerPoint. Uh, uh, now, this is what I call the broader Middle East. Uh, from Pakistan in the east, uh, through Afghanistan and Iran, and then into the Arab world, Iraq, the Arabian Peninsula, anchored by Saudi Arabia, countries of the Levant, uh, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, the Palestinian territories, and then through North Africa. Egypt, Libya, Algeria, uh, Morocco. Uh, what is, what's the unifying thread on that? Uh, well, it's entirely arbitrary. Those are the places I served. Um, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan are not uh, traditionally considered part of the broader Middle East, but 
as you look at um, uh, a socio-political environment, uh, the currents running through those countries you find elsewhere um, uh, in the region. Um, so history, you've been forewarned, yes, I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, the year 1798 has considerable significance uh, in the history between the Middle East and the West. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know what that significance is. I don't want everybody to speak at once. Uh, oh, come on, this is a, this is a top tier university. And I know you know. <laughs> uh, 1798 was the year that Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt. Um, you know, most people don't know Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt. He did have some time to kill between major European engagements, so he thought he'd uh, polish up his game in Egypt. Uh, why is it significant? In an important sense, that marked an era of Middle Eastern relations with the West in which we still dwell. Um, at least from the Middle Eastern perspective. Um, because beginning in 1798, uh, virtually every territory on this map, all the way across, the exception of central Saudi Arabia, in the pre-oil days there was nothing there but sand and who wanted it, uh, and the interior parts of Yemen. Um, different languages, religions, cultures, worldviews, one thing in common for every one of those territories. Every single one of them was invaded and occupied by at least one Western army. Uh, you know, Brits in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, didn't go so well for them in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Iran, a zone of influence between the British and the Russians. Iraq, Kuwait. Uh, the, 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 the coastal states, uh, that was Britain, Syria, Lebanon, uh, that was France, uh, Jordan, the Palestine uh, mandate, Egypt, the British, uh, Libya, the Italians, the rest of North Africa, the French, uh, and there are more, the Russians in Afghanistan, the Americans in Iraq, the Americans in Afghanistan, on it goes. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind because, you know, we don't see ourselves as colonialists, imperialists, and occupiers. I mean, we're the anti-imperialists. We fought an empire for our own independence. You know, that's who we are. That isn't how the region sees us. With this long period of occupation um, and imperial conquest, uh, this region is conditioned to the West as that power that's in their backyard. And we are the successors to the British, to the French, to the Russians. That's how the Iranians see us. Uh, that the British simply handed off to us after World War II, and we took up the British imperial role in Iran. Uh, so, you know, knowing history not just as we write it, but how other peoples perceive their own histories uh, is, is critically important. Uh, so there's a direct line um, from the French in, in uh, Egypt in 1798 uh, and the Americans in Afghanistan today via all those other stops by other powers in other countries. And it is part of the broader uh, Middle East worldview or view of the West. Um, I'll take you to another moment in history. Um, just about 100 years ago, 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement between Britain and France. Not, again, a household phrase. Uh, but Sykes-Picot is what drew this map. Um, in 
The map was sanctified in the Versailles uh, peace talks to formally conclude World War I and the Versailles Treaty. And what it did is it gave really Britain and France uh, control through uh, a, a, a group of mandates uh, over Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt. Uh, the French got their role in uh, North Africa sanctified. And all those lines on the map, that came out of World War I, Sykes-Picot, uh, and the Versailles Peace Accords. Where was the U.S. in this? And since presidential leadership is a theme here with the president's uh, leadership program, we'll come back to this. That map could have been different. Uh, Woodrow Wilson went to Versailles with a very different concept of what the region and the world should look, look like. Um, he came with the notion of self-determination. Uh, uh, there should be an independent Kurdish nation, an independent Armenian nation, independent, an independent Arab nation or nations. Uh, that's not how the British and the French saw it. Uh, they stood their ground and Woodrow Wilson said, ah, you know, uh, these are distant peoples of whom we know little and care less. You know, let the British and French do what they want. Uh, uh, he just decided basically that it wasn't important enough to fight about. Uh, uh, and again, I'll return to this, presidential leadership is important. So the, the British and the French got the map they wanted. Um, uh, we didn't get the one we wanted but we didn't seem to want it um, uh, all that much. Um, so, so there's the map. Um, uh, let's just fast forward that roughly 100 years to today. Uh, this is without question the most chaotic, turbulent, and tumultuous time this region has seen in the hundred years of its modern history. Um, you've all seen the images, uh, you've read the stories. Let me just trace out, if I could, a few organizing themes that um, uh, may not be right, but I've found them helpful. Um, we are looking at a period of unprecedented state failure in the Middle East. Um, failed states, Syria and its awful civil war, a completely failed state. Yemen in a civil war of its own with regional involvement directly, a completely failed state. Libya uh, being torn apart by rival governments and rival militias, a completely failed state. Uh, Iraq, not quite yet. I think it's a failed state. I don't think it can recover. Um, Afghanistan is teetering. In, in 100 years, the region has not seen this kind of uh, uh, intense tumult. Uh, what does that mean? We're not there yet, but failed states may mean uh, a broader failure of the Westphalian state system in the Middle East. Uh, uh, more of that to follow, uh, but that would be a pretty grave outcome given its strategic importance, uh, given uh, uh, the fact that the world still depends on energy resources from the Middle East, uh, and given the fact that um, there is one declared uh, nuclear state, nuclear weapon state in the region, Pakistan, and one undeclared nuclear weapon state, which is Israel. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I am accused of being relentlessly pessimistic. Um, uh, about the region, so I'll inject a note of the best I can do for optimism. It, as bad as things are today, I can assure you they are better than they're going to be in three months. 
Uh, so, hey, live in the moment, enjoy. So, uh, 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 we talk about intelligence failures in the Middle East and elsewhere. They're not really intelligence failures. The intelligence is out there. It's a failure of imagination that we cannot imagine how things are going to develop. I could not have imagined when I left Iraq in 2009 uh, that the Islamic State uh, would be dominant in one big chunk of it, uh, and Iran and its proxy militias would be dominant uh, in others. I, you know, President Bush, he had nicknames for everybody. You know, my nickname, which I got in my first week on a job, was Sunshine, <laughs> because of my irrepressible optimism. Uh, you know, my failure was that I was not pessimistic enough. So uh, let your imagination uh, uh, run around tonight uh, when you're uh, trying to get to sleep. Uh, as bad as it is, believe me, it can get a whole lot worse uh, as one contemplates the possibility of systemic state failure in the region. Um, uh, now, what underlies the failure of states? Uh, I'm very, very leery of single theories to explain everything. And this isn't a single theory, but it is an important factor. Um, it's a failure of governance. Um, uh, a failure of successive rulers uh, to provide security, prosperity, services, uh, the prospect of a good today and a better tomorrow. Uh, you, you can look at the Middle East as a succession of isms. Uh, we're talking about the last hundred years, start with colonialism. Uh, uh, then monarchism in, in uh, places like Egypt and Iraq. Uh, well, those were not examples of great governance. Uh, uh, the, uh, the colonialists gave way, in many cases, to monarchies who were overthrown, in many cases, by, let's pick them, uh, Arab nationalists. We had Arab nationalism in the person of Gamal Abdel Nasser and others who emulated him. Uh, we had undecorated authoritarianism, uh, often flowing out of those same uh, Arab nationalist regimes. Uh, the region tried a few other isms along the way. Uh, Baathism in Iraq and Syria, that's Arab socialism. Uh, uh, communism that only took uh, control in one country, South Yemen, but was a force in a number of other countries. Um, none of these isms delivered the fruits of good governance. Uh, uh, they were intolerant. Uh, abusive of individual um, uh, rights. Um, they were arbitrary and they were corrupt. Okay, there's a new ism on the Middle East bloc. It's Islamism. Obviously, Islam has been around in the Middle East uh, since uh, Islam was established. Uh, but with the Islamic State, and that's now controlling a pretty big chunk of territory in Syria and Iraq. Uh, region seen something it hadn't seen before. Islamic State is quite different from Al-Qaeda. Yeah, remember the test, so you gotta, you gotta get this point. Uh, Al-Qaeda did not believe in immediate control of territory. Uh, uh, that comes after you know, the fulfillment of the vision. Then you establish the caliphate. For Islamic State, the caliphate is now. And that's why Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, last June, June of 2014, proclaimed himself caliph uh, from the largest uh, uh, mosque in Mosul in northern Iraq after they took control of it. If you want to know what's going to happen to the Islamic State, don't count up the number of our uh, virtually ineffectual airstrikes. Look at how they govern. Uh, 
See if you can figure out whether somebody in Mosul, Iraq, or Raqqa, Syria, um, can say to himself, gee, you know, life is better today than it was before these guys got here. Uh, now, we see them as horrible monsters, and indeed they are. Um, but they, they know the governance story. And Islamic State uh, works really hard at their brand of governance. Uh, uh, you know, they move into a city, um, uh, they kill the prisoners, uh, they rape non-Muslim women, and then they pick up the garbage. Uh, uh, they get the electricity running again. Uh, uh, justice is harsh, but it is pretty predictable. Uh, and by and large, as far as we can tell, they're not personally corrupt. Uh, the governments ruling the lands they occupy now were hideously corrupt, arbitrary, often violent, and so forth. So, you know, that's what the Islamic State's targeted on. Uh, being able to control, to expand, but to govern. And if they pull this off, they're, they're going to do something that very few uh, uh, governments in this region have ever managed. So watch that space more than any other. Um, coming back to humility for a moment. Now that I've laid out these grand theories, uh, let me tell you why they're not so grand. Um, you know, in the 50s, the monarchies were going down. Uh, Egypt and Iraq, Jordan teetered uh, so uh, close to the brink that the British actually sent in ground forces to support the very young King Hussein. And that really sparked a wave of speculation in the West that, um, boy, those monarchies, you know, we know what to do with monarchies, overthrow them. Uh, they are artifacts of history. They're going to collapse under their own weight. It's just a question of time. Uh, but you look at this map today, where there's trouble and where there's not, you know, the trouble is, without exception, in the so-called republics. Uh, uh, Again, you know, Libya, Egypt after um, the Arab Spring in Tahrir Square in 2011, uh, Syria, Syrian Arab Republic, uh, Iraq, and the trouble isn't in the monarchies. Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE, Doha, Bahrain, Kuwait, all doing pretty well. Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, the only country that's in flames is the one country that is not a monarchy, and that is Yemen. Uh, over here in North Africa, you can say it's, ah, it's oil. Well, over here in North Africa, Morocco is a monarchy that hasn't got any oil, um, and touch wood for them, not too many problems either. Uh, okay, I give you this exception to Crocker's grand theory number three to make the point on humility. Uh, uh, be careful, you don't think you understand more than you do. How is it that these absolutist monarchies are still on their feet? Um, you know, again, the modesty element. Their rulers have learned there are a lot of ways to stay in touch with your people and meet their needs that don't go through the ballot box. Uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who died in January, was an unlettered man, no formal schooling, spoke no foreign languages. He could have been an honorary American. Uh, <laughs> uh, hated to travel abroad, but he was all over his kingdom. You know, constantly on the move. Uh, uh, spending a week with one tribe, moving on to the next, contracting a marriage here. Uh, he knew what was going on in his kingdom. Sultan of Oman, the same way. Uh, Sultan spends 60 days a year living in a tent uh, that he uh, moves around with him as he traverses and crisscrosses the country. Uh, you know, every village, uh, every town, the Sultan's going to be there uh, during those 60 days. You know, 
he's got, he's got a good feel uh, that he does not need to run a public opinion poll uh, uh, to validate. Am I saying these are model forms of government? Good Lord, no, uh, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying that if you're trying to figure out who may go south next, you better look really, really deep, uh, again, at, at history, at patterns of association, uh, at how rulers interact with their people. Um, uh, it, it surprises a lot of people. So again, uh, as you try to find that overarching explanation to the Middle East, you know, there isn't one. Uh, you got to look at every issue, every area uh, in its own terms. Here's another overarching concept to work with, trying to un unpack the Middle East. It's a notion of a Middle Eastern Cold War. Uh, uh, we know about the big Cold War between us and the Soviet Union uh, that went on from the end of World War II until the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. It called the Cold War because uh, while we were both participants in some in conflicts around the world, uh, we never clashed directly with each other. That's why I kind of like the construct for the Middle East. The Cold War protagonists in this case uh, are Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you see their proxies uh, duking it out, certainly in Yemen, uh, where um, the, uh, the Houthis who uh, pushed the last government out of Sana'a are a Shia uh, offshoot. Uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and others are now uh, actively involved in an air campaign, not against the Iranians, oh no, but against their proxies uh, in Yemen. Syria, uh, the uh, Alawi regime of Bashar al-Assad, heavily backed by Iran, uh, while the Saudis, the Qataris, and some others are pushing money into Sunni oppositions. Uh, uh, in Lebanon, where this is in a department of just wait, things will get worse, uh, the civil war has not recurred, uh, but maybe around the next corner, same thing. I spent too many years in a Lebanon riven by uh, sectarian violence. Uh, it's there to be resumed with the same players in it. Uh, since this is a Cold War between the Shia power of Iran and the Sunni power of Saudi Arabia, it means that a region full of conflicts over the last hundred years is now seeing those conflicts at a new intensity denominated not in political or power terms, but in sectarian terms. Uh, in Iraq, it's Sunnis against Shia. In Yemen, uh, in, uh, in, in Syria. Uh, not everywhere. Libya doesn't have any Shia, and they're doing perfectly well murdering each other, even though they're all of the same uh, sectarian group, Sunni Islam. Uh, uh, but I, I do find this, uh, this notion of the Middle Eastern Cold War helpful in explaining some of what's going on in the, um, uh, the, various, the various hot wars. Uh, another point, the U.S., consequences for the U.S. It is interesting to me that the time of greatest tumult in the Middle East also matches the time of greatest U.S. disengagement from the Middle East. Uh, since World War II. World War II brought us to the Middle East. We weren't there before. Uh, starting with uh, Harry Truman, on through just about every president we've had, there has been a presidential doctrine centered on the Middle East, defining what happens in the Middle East as a vital U.S. interest which we would use force uh, to protect our equities there. Truman and Eisenhower doctrines were uh, quintessential Cold War doctrines. 
uh, you, you went on to uh, the Reagan Doctrine, also centered on the Middle East. The Clinton Doctrine was more on Bosnia, but had Middle East applications. Um, we all know about the Bush Doctrine. Uh, there, there is no Obama Doctrine. Um, so this is the final broad point I'll make. Uh, you know, I went to school in the Middle East for more than three and a half decades. Uh, and I learned approximately two things. Uh, uh, you know, I figure one thing every couple of decades. Uh, it, it, it's a good pace. I can stay with that. Uh, try that with your professors. See, see how far you get. So, uh, the first thing I learned is be careful what you get into. Um, I, I, uh, I was present on the ground in, in Lebanon in the early 80s when uh, we were not careful what we got into when we and the Israelis thought it'd be a really nice idea for the Israeli army to sweep through southern Lebanon and eliminate the Palestinian terrorist organizations. I mean, who could argue with that? Uh, but we didn't think it through. Um, Military engagements in that region don't have third and fourth order, order consequences. They have 30th and 40th order consequences uh, that are unforeseeable when your troops cross the line of departure. Getting rid of the PLO, terrific idea, and the Israelis largely did. But what happened a year later? Instead of, his, uh, instead of the PLO, you had Hezbollah. Uh, far, far more lethal than the PLO ever thought of being and aimed right at us. Uh, by not getting that one right, uh, I almost lost my life on April 18, 1983 when the American Embassy was blown up by Hezbollah with me in it. 244 Americans did lose their lives six months later because we thought it was a good idea to get rid of the PLO and didn't have the imagination to see what might come next which was his bullet. I, I saw it in Iraq. Uh, I went into Iraq right after the fall of um, Baghdad. I was there on the smoke and the dust trying to put some structure together. Um, we thought it'd be a good idea to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Well, who could not like getting rid of the region's greatest mass murderer who had killed tens of thousands of Iraqi Kurds, Shia, and indeed his own community of Sunnis. That's got to be good. Yeah, but then what? And you could see it in the spring of 2003, the oh my God moment, then what? Um, well, we saw what? Uh, a, a devastating civil war uh, uh, eventually tap, tamped down uh, by the surge of troops when I was there in 2007, 2008, but at what cost? Uh, uh, in, in more than 4,400 American lives and tens of thousands of Iraqi lives. Yet the situation stabilized uh, the, the, the last half of my tour and beyond, which takes me to the second thing I learned in the Middle East. Uh, if you need to be careful about what you get into, be just as careful over what you propose to get out of. That the process of disengagement can have consequences as grave or graver than your initial engagement. Uh, uh, and in Iraq, we failed both tests. We weren't careful getting in, and in my view, we were not careful getting out in 2011. Uh, so Iraq has unspooled. Uh, uh, since we withdrew our forces and withdrew our political interest in 2011. What do we have today? As I said, Islamic State in one big chunk of the country, the Iranians and their proxies uh, in another big chunk of the country. Uh, uh, somebody a lot brighter than I am is going to have to explain to you why that is in the American interest. Uh, a country where, when I left in 2009, we had considerable influence and which was experiencing considerable stability until we decided we were done. Um, I'll give you a final example of that. I, I am dean of the Bush School. That's named after George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president, 
greatest foreign policy president uh, this country has ever had. Uh, he knew the world, ambassador to the United Nations, director of Central Intelligence, uh, uh, first envoy to China, the best national security team the country's seen collectively, yet he made one very bad mistake that people don't recall right now. After we worked with the Pakistanis to arm and equip an anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan, which they occupied during the 1980s, we decided we're done. We could see that the country was going to spin into civil war because the only thing unifying the Mujahideen groups was hatred of the Soviets. Soviets were gone. They would, they would be at each other to see who ruled in Kabul. Uh, we did something else, too. Pakistan had been our strongest ally in this fight. Uh, the whole anti-Soviet jihad was staged out of northwest Pakistan, uh, um, using Pakistani networks into Afghanistan. So not only did we say we're done in Afghanistan, we said to the Pakistanis, oh, yeah, well, look, we needed you for the last 10 years to fight the Soviets, but we don't need you anymore. So that nuclear weapons program that we know um, uh, that, that you've had for ages, um, uh, we're now going to slap sanctions on you for it. So the Pakistanis overnight went from being the most allied of allies to the uh, most sanctioned of adversaries. Now, that's a Pakistani narrative, but there's a lot of truth to it. So what happened? Horrific civil war, uh, the Americans said to the Pakistanis, don't even call, we're not answering. Uh, eventually, after four bloody years, the Taliban started to emerge. The Pakistanis saw something they could work with to tamp down a civil war that could destabilize their own country, went in full bore behind the Taliban. Um, and then we got 9-11. And I asked myself, if the Bush administration had decided after the Soviets left, we're going to stay engaged here. We're going to stay engaged in Pakistan. We are going to work to prevent a really bad crisis from erupting in Afghanistan. I wonder if we'd still see the Twin Towers today. Who knows? But the point is, disengagement, whether it's Afghanistan, uh, 1990, Iraq, 2011, can have incredibly grave consequences. So careful getting in, careful getting out. Now, you really thought I was going to talk about what's going on in all these places in the Middle East. No, I was just going to bore you with overarching concepts. We can talk about the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, what the Islamic State's likely to do next, uh, the, the refugee crisis, uh, and I hope we will. But I, I kind of wanted to set a broad stage for you as you try and decipher the headlines. The last thing I'm going to say is really about you um, and, and, and your future. Um, I, I hope you will all go to hard places and do hard things. Um, you know, the value of life is not measured in the number of trips to the mall. Um, uh, it, it's not measured by the size of your bank accounts. Uh, it's measured by what you do, not for yourself, uh, but for your community, your state, your country, humanity. Uh, so I hope you will think about ways to get involved, uh, to get involved in a greater good, a larger purpose uh, than, than yourselves and your immediate fortunes. I hope some of you will look at the Foreign Service. Uh, it is a desperately hard service. Uh, we're tiny. The entire Foreign Service Officer Corps is uh, about the size of the combined ship, ship's company and air department on a single U.S. aircraft carrier. Uh, there are about 6,000 Foreign Service Officers worldwide. Uh, so. We are the most expeditionary of America's services. My, uh, my beloved Marines hate it when I say that. Um, but a far greater percentage of your foreign service is deployed any given day than 
the Marine Corps is deployed. That's why they call it the Foreign Service. Uh, and since the end of World War II, substantially more American ambassadors have been killed in the line of duty than have American generals or admirals, even though generals and admirals outnumber ambassadors by hundreds to one. I, I was an ambassador six times. In three of those countries, a predecessor of mine as ambassador was assassinated. Um, so it's a hard service, but if you, if you want to feel you've done something, if you want to be where it counts for America, think about it. And if government just completely turns you off, uh, I mean, think about other things. I, I'm on the board of Mercy Corps. Uh, we have a huge operation going in Syria. Uh, uh, a lot of people staffed around it. Mercy Corps has no good assignments. We don't have a London or a Paris. Uh, uh, the best we can offer you is Beirut, and then it goes downhill from there. Uh, but you're out where it counts. You're, you're out doing something hard that makes a difference. Um, find your comfort zone and then get outside of it. You know, that, that in my view is, is what life's all about.